Amen. Today, we went back and forth a little bit throughout the week uh, about what we were going to celebrate today. If today was just going to be the uh, final day before, final Sunday before Advent, before we start that long walk towards Christmas. Uh, if it was just going to be uh, ordinary time. I, I've been on a lectionary kick for a while. And part of the issue is the holiday is called Christ the King Sunday. If you're a lectionary church, that's the, the recognition of the end of the uh, liturgical year. I mean, it's got, uh, it's got kind of a, a past or a present. It's kind of tenuous. It's kind of checkered. See, it's not as old, like Christmas and Easter, well, Easter, we've been celebrating since the beginning. Like that was our first holiday. That's what separates Christianity from kind of every other, all the rest. Christmas came along a little lot later. And then Advent and Lent, you've heard these words, yes, Advent and Lent. Those are thousands of years old, liturgically speaking. We've been recognizing and remembering this. Christ the King Sunday is, as of this year, 99 years old. So it doesn't have the, the, the heft that it or a Lent has. It was added uh, by our uh, Catholic brothers and sisters, Pope Pius. Uh, he added it uh, for theological and political reasons at both. See, in 1925, in the wake of World War I, the world was like really tired of spe speeches about kings and kaisers, czars. And Pope Pius felt the need to reassert globally that Wilhelm was not king. Ferdinand was not king, but Jesus is the primary authority in the Christian's life. I kind of feel like this got cemented in the years coming when folks like Mussolini, Hitler, Stalin, who want to be the center of worship in people's lives. And with the rise of global fascism in today's day, there is a question of its relevance. Some Christian family members reject it whole cloth as a holiday, and for legitimate reasons. Referring to Christ as king, you know, for somebody who is as sensitive about uh, overly gendered language, there's kind of hard to imagine a non, uh, there's a bit, there isn't a bigger symbol for male-centered uh, patriarchy than a king. Then there's kind of the theological issue of Jesus kind of dictating to us our lives the way a king might, preferring instead to refer to the present future mission of the church and what Jesus proclaimed as a kingdom. Like you and I are kin, family, familiar, a kingdom, rather kingdom. I, I don't know, to be honest. Sometimes overly emphasizing uh, to make a whole Sunday about one singular metaphor, I don't know if it's always in, if it's, it's needed for forever. I mean, if the Pope decided that this year we're going to have President Jesus, <laughs> or God help us, Christ the CEO Sunday, <laughs> no, that's our rumbles. I'm good. Which brings us to today's gospel reading in John. Which, this is the assigned reading for Christ the King Sunday. And you want to talk about like jarring. Last week, we were in the middle of, like, store, uh, of teaching from Jesus. We're in the gospel of Mark, which is like, there's, it, it's very direct and action-oriented. And next week, we start to walk towards Christmas. It's Advent. There's a cradle. And here we are. What are we doing at the crucifixion? The trial before the crucifixion. This seems radically out of place. So you got to know what the build-up for this is. You, you, you actually have to feel the story leading up to this moment. This is one of those walking into the room and you missed the 20 minutes that got to everyone yelling. If you're here on a communion Sunday, you get to hear and recount the story of the night 
before this event. Jesus is in the upper room having a meal with his friends and followers. He t- teaches them. He prays with them. According to one gospel, they sang a hymn. They recited a psalm. After their meal, they, as- they, they descend into this garden to pray for strength, for themselves and for the church. And then leading a detachment of soldiers, officers, and religious leaders to arrest Jesus, one of his own led them. Someone who had walked with Jesus, seen the miracles, knew the teachings, betray him to these soldiers armed with bats, swords, and restraints try to arrest Jesus. Peter, always speak, always acting from his gut, and yet still brown-nosing, drew out his sword and cut off the ear of one of the soldiers. Jesus rebukes Peter, disarms him, and heals the one who came to arrest him. He healed one of the soldiers who likely moments later would beat him. The theologian I appreciate once said, when Jesus disarms Peter, Jesus disarmed the church. This is the authority. This is what a king in this world looks like. Being able to snuff out opposition with violence. The undertones and undercurrents of all authority. That would have been the symbol of power for Jesus in Jesus' world. Jesus, after being arrested, endured brutality, was beaten, mocked, and then brought before Pilate. He, Pilate, is the extension of Caesar at that time. He is the ruling authority. He can tell who lives and who dies. His authority is enforced with a military. He is clothed in power and violence. Power through violence. And Pilate asks, are you a king? Jesus responds, my kingdom is not of this world. No kidding. Kingdoms of this world are known by strength. By putting you down. How hard a boot can be placed on the neck of your enemies. Jesus doesn't eradicate his enemies. Jesus doesn't smite evil with the vengeful hand of God. Jesus doesn't force any border. He doesn't mandate a payment. Jesus doesn't even call on his followers to defend him. He actually uses that as the example of how different his kingdom is going to be. And even me, I'm confronted by the truth in this passage. If, if, because in this story, I mean, I might be more like a Roman soldier than in any of the Jewish people of this time. I recognize that no matter how peaceful I choose to be or how friendly I want to be in this world, I am somebody's enemy. And the God made real in Jesus Christ is the God of all people. And that includes the people I oppose. What we need is not a king who perpetuates violence, but one who rejects the very nature of it. When Jesus says his kingdom is not of this world, he isn't suggesting, suggesting that he'll wield some divine power as some kind of heavenly Caesar. Instead, his power breaks the cycle of violence. He's not a conqueror. Jesus is not a ruler or an enforcer. He's a savior. When, you, when we talked about the garden that night, where would you have been? Who could you see yourself as? Could you be a Judas? I could. Jesus frequently isn't reflecting what I want Jesus to I can sometimes get irritated with the very teaching and example of Jesus when I am completely justified in keeping my anger towards that person. That person has done 
wrong. That person has done my community wrong. That person is just plain wrong, and I hate them for it. Jesus comes to me and says, no, you don't get to hate them. But I want to, Jesus. Why can't Jesus just affirm my prejudices? I could have been a Peter. Lord knows I could be Peter. Anybody, who wanna, anybody else ever sometimes wake up and choose violence? <laughs> Not today. You messed around and you're going to find out. But to be honest, if I was anybody, I'd more likely be one of the disciples who froze and just let the evil happen. And if I could muster up the strength to move, I ran away. But the truth is that Jesus, he, Jesus offers a, something radically different than running away, than staying frozen. Jesus disarms Peter. Jesus offers himself to be beaten. He goes willingly to the cross. He revealed a kingdom not built on power, but love. Jesus knows that the violence and the desire for it that is in us, whether it started with the, the, the myth of Cain and Abel, but it is very real today, the cycle of violence that it will eventually destroy us. And that we don't need a king of vengeance. We don't need a political ruler. We need a heart surgeon. We need a king in a cradle. A king who pulls from the bottom of our souls a desire to know and to be known by God. We don't need a king to enforce obedience. We need a king that inspires such gratitude and reverence that we are moved to bow at the very presence of God. It brings me to my favorite Christmas song. I don't know if it's planned. <laughs> oh, holy night. <laughs> Jerry's, gonna, Jerry's taking a note. No, I, 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 I'll suggest them in non-sermon at times when I suggest my other songs. But Oh Holy Night, it's, one, it's my favorite Christmas song. Absolutely. Without that, it's a solo piece. You got to hear it. It starts off so bouncy. Bum, 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 bum. Yeah, you know, like a new and glorious morn. It's, it's just bouncy and fun. And then it turns minor. And what's the line? Fall on your knees. One of y'all is going to sing it so much better. <laughs> Fall on your knees. Bend the knee. Kneel. We kneel before a God who comes to us unarmed and vulnerable. A God who loves without measure or caution. A God who endures the worst humanity could inflict and responds not with vengeance, but with forgiveness. This is not hot justice tempered by mercy. This is justice conceived in mercy. Now I affirm the United Methodist teaching on nonviolence. I think that the inhumanity of war is almost never justified. I think the death penalty, the death penalty is incompatible with Christian teaching. And I teach my sons that how much fear you inspire is no measure of manhood. Amen? Generosity, bravery, curiosity, endurance, those are way better stepping stones. But I must admit that my comfort, my ability to stand in, this, in the righteous position of nonviolence, as much as I want to proclaim and affirm and stand with and practice nonviolence, my ability to do so is sustained by violence elsewhere. My peaceful existence is secured by systems of oppression I rarely come in contact with. 
As much as I profess peace in the truth, the truth is I benefit from violence. Historically, systematically, and daily in places that I don't regularly see. Whether I've been kept from seeing them or I have not seen them by omission or commission. We need a Savior who shatters our delusions of safety and self-righteousness. At the feet of this King, all we can do is surrender what trophies we have obtained and kneel. Christ's kingdom rejects the values of this world's kingdoms. The kingdom of God has no borders, weapons, or retribution. It is a kingdom where love replaces power, mercy supplants vengeance, joy overcomes hatred, and hope pierces the darkness like candle in midnight. A kingdom where the closest, where, <laughs> no, a kingdom where the closets that we have hidden turn into pantries of bounty. Where the cycles of violence is removed entirely and replaced with a cycle of planting, harvest, and rest. We need a king whose crown is made of thorns, not jewels. A throne that is a cross instead of a gushing room with opulence. We need a king whose love shines brighter and purer than all the mind. And at God's pierced feet, we lay down our preferences, our prejudices, our own little kingdoms, and call God, fair Jesus, beautiful Savior. And may we fall on our knees, for Christ is indeed King. Amen.